Class, today we're going to be talking about oral hygiene and bathing. Exceptionally important for good health, both components of that. Um, making sure you're taking care of the mouth, the teeth, the skin. Um, it will help decrease microbes, decrease infection, help promote a sense of well-being, and help promote circulation. So something we always want to make sure we're taking care of for our residents when they cannot do that themselves. So when we're looking at the purpose of hygiene, it promotes comfort, safety, and promotes health. It helps pr protect against disease. So your skin is your first line barrier to infection, and so we need to make sure we're keeping it clean and intact at all times. Our mucous membranes, those openings, like the opening to the mouth, um, they need to stay clean and intact for good health so we don't get as much bacteria in them. And it also, good hygiene, it prevents odors. It makes a person feel good. It helps promote relaxation and circulation. If you've ever gone camping, first night without a shower, you're probably okay. But by the second night, it's like, gee, boy, I wish I could just take a shower. It just feels like your skin's crawling. Third night, it's just getting even worse. So it's, it's really important for just an overall sense of well-being to be clean. So the skin is actually the largest organ of the body. It is a protective covering. It is our first line barrier to infection, we said, so very important we keep it clean and intact. It also helps maintain fluid balance and it helps regulate our body temperature. So if you're really cold, your body is going to start shivering to increase heat, to actually make heat production. If you're really hot, you're gonna start sweating more to get rid of that extra heat. It also is a sensory structure. There's heat and cold and pain receptors in the skin. So you, you recognize when you're touching something cold, when you're touching something hot. And then your teeth and gums are also part of this system as well, and we need to keep those intact as, as well. So when we talk about daily care, um, there's before breakfast care or our AM care. And that's generally, we will let them wash their hands and their face, brush their teeth if they want to before they eat. Some, some residents like to brush their teeth before they eat. Some people like to brush after they eat. So that's a very personal choice, and there's no reason whichever they prefer that we can't do that for them. Um, if they wear dentures, we need to get their dentures cleaned off and get them into their mouth and their eyeglasses and get them ready for their breakfast. And then after breakfast, we do our regular morning care. It's a much more thorough care where if it's their shower day, we'll help take them to the shower. If it's not, we can do a partial bath, get them dressed, um, oral care again if they wanted or if they didn't do it before. Um, all very important for good health. And then evening care or PM care is that care we do before bedtime. And usually people like to brush their teeth again before they go to bed. Um, they might want to wash their hands and face again, put lotion on, have a back rub maybe for some relaxation, and then, get, um, and then it'll help them relax and promote circulation before bedtime. So oral hygiene is important. Brushing teeth and flossing, um, I know if the resident wants to have their teeth flossed, we can do that for them. I mentioned before doing oral care before they eat versus after they eat. That is really a personal choice. Um, I think your book talks about you know doing it after they eat, but it really is a personal choice. Many people like to brush their teeth before they eat. Some people prefer to do it after. There was actually a large study done on patients with dysphagia, and they found that patients with dysphagia, if they brushed their teeth before they ate, there would be less bacteria in the mouth. So if they did aspirate, they would actually um, have less bacteria being swallowed down with it into the lungs. But either way, so long as they're getting brushed regularly, we're doing good. When you brush someone's teeth, you want to make sure they're sitting all the way up. 75 to 90 degrees, they should be sitting up. We should have a clothing protector across their chest. Uh, we want to make sure we have their kidney basin, the little emesis basin for them to um, spit the toothpaste out, their toothpaste, their toothbrush. And when we're brushing someone's teeth, we want to brush all surfaces of the teeth. We want to brush gently, and we want to make sure we're brushing the tongue as well, because the tongue gets a lot of fuzz and a lot of um, microbes on it. So we want to make sure we're brushing all surfaces of the teeth gently and the tongue gently let them spit, rinse their mouth out as they need to, and if things are starting to go down in their face, that's a dignity issue, make sure you're wiping it up as you go along. If you notice anything unusual, there's bleeding maybe when you're brushing the teeth, the gums start to bleed, 
or they're complaining of pain or discomfort to a tooth or they have an unusual odor to their mouth, we want to make sure we let the nurse know. And the other thing to keep in mind is the gums and the teeth have a lot of microbes in them, so we need to be following standard precautions. We should be wearing gloves for this. Now, if you have to do oral care for an unconscious person, and remember when a person is unconscious, it means they are unaware of their surroundings, which means they're not going to be eating and drinking because they're not responding, so they can't eat and drink. Um, they're not going to be able to brush their own teeth. So if we have to brush somebody's teeth that ha is unconscious, um, we want to prevent aspiration while we do this because they aren't going to be able to spit that toothpaste out. So one of the best things you can do is roll them on their side and do a sideline position, which is known as a lateral position. So we roll them on their side. We put a towel down underneath their mouth inside of their head. Put the little emesis basin right there. And you want to use a padded tongue blade to hold the mouth open. We don't put our fingers in somebody's mouth, so we would use a padded tongue blade to hold the mouth open. Once a day, you should still actually be brushing their teeth. And you use very minimal water, very minimal toothpaste, and you can brush just a few teeth, and then you swab it up, because they can't spit that toothpaste out. Brush a couple teeth, you swab it up, and then you take it, when you're all done getting all the way around the mouth, you take a clean swab and get it wet and wring it out really good and swab the entire mouth. And we'll show you how to do this in the clinical setting. Um, if the person is unconscious and we said that, so they can't eat and drink, the mouth dries out really bad, we want to do some type of mouth care every two hours. So once a day we do recommend that you go ahead and actually brush the teeth um, and then because that will actually take off plaque and any tartar. But then every two hours to keep the mouth from drying out, you take one of those toothettes. It looks like a popsicle stick with a piece of foam on the end of it. You get it wet, you wring it out really good, and you swab around their mouth every two hours to keep it moist and freshened up. The other thing to keep in mind when a person's unconscious, even though they can't respond to you, they may still be able to hear you, so you still need to explain what you're doing for them, um, you know, talk to them, make, always make sure you're being very, very respectful. Now, if a person is unconscious and they wear dentures, we do leave the dentures out. We do not keep dentures in the mouth. So this is what it looks like. The person's in this lateral position. They've got that padded tongue blade to hold the mouth open. They're only brushing a couple teeth at one time. But then again, because they can't spit it up, you need some toothettes there to actually swab up that toothpaste and toothbrush. Or, I'm sorry, that toothpaste and um, um, saliva and stuff up. Now, denture care, if a person has false teeth and they wear dentures, we do take them out at night. So at nighttime, they're removed and they're put in a denture. We clean them. We put them in a denture cup. And when, a, when dentures are not going to go back in the person's mouth, we want to make sure that we cover them up with kind of a cool, lukewarm type of water. Um, the chill should be taken off of the water, but it should not be hot. So at night, they're stored it covered in water. During the day, in the morning, when we come on, we would make sure that we um, re-clean the dentures if necessary and then help them put them in their mouth. Some people use a denture adhesive, and when they do use a denture adhesive, I always ask them, do you like just a few drops around the part where it adheres to the gums, or do you want to strip all the way around? Because um, some people like it one way or the other. You can use, they do make denture toothbrushes, but if you, um, if they don't have one, we can use a regular toothbrush for it. So we use a cool water, not cold, but cool, we line the sink with a towel, or we can plug the sink and fill the sink up with a third full worth of water. Now, if I was doing home care and I'm in the person's own home giving denture care, I would be comfortable plugging the sink and putting water in it. But in the nursing home, there's, as we mentioned, there's Jack and Jill bathrooms. Um, there, sometimes there's four residents sharing a, a bathroom. The sinks aren't always maybe as clean, clean as they should be, so probably better to, to line it with a small hand towel or a washcloth to line the sink. The whole purpose of lining that um, sink is if you accidentally drop those dentures, um, it won't hopefully won't chip the teeth, won't break them, because if they do break, then the facility usually needs to replace them for them if we did it, and that's a very expensive fix. So we clean their dentures. Um, you, they can take them out after meals. We can clean them. 
um, as I mentioned at night, we would cover them up with water and put them in their denture cup. You never wrap up dentures in a Kleenex or a napkin when they're out of the mouth because they might accidentally get thrown out. And as with oral care or unconscious oral care or denture care, we're going to be wearing gloves for this. Now when you brush someone's dentures, you brush all surfaces of the teeth and all surfaces of the denture inside and out. So every surface of this denture is going to get brushed. Now, as far as what problems can happen from poor dental health, um, heart disease. They have found that people that have poor um, dental health, that for some reason when they do get um, infections in their mouth, it tends to gravitate straight to the heart and can actually cause infections in the heart. Um, mouth cancer, diabetes, gum disease, tooth loss, bad breath, dental decay, lung conditions, more because there's bacteria in there and if they aspirate there's more bacteria that can go down into the lungs and they have even linked it to strokes. So good dental health is really important for people. Now if we're bathing our patient, again it will depend on the facility as to what the shower or bathing schedule is, but we want to follow the personal choices as much as we can for a person. So if they need to, if we're going to be giving them a bath, really beneficial to let them go to the bathroom first. It never fails. You get your patient all set up to get that bath, you get all the equipment you need, you get that warm water perfect, you get the bed in and up position, you're getting ready to give them a bath, and they have to go to the bathroom. So put everything down, help them to the bathroom, and then come back and start all over. So just help them with elimination before you even get there. We cover them up with warmth and privacy. We use our privacy curtains and a bath blanket. And when you're washing a person, you only uncover the body part that you're working on. We need to make sure we're protecting them from falls. So we need to make sure that we never leave that bed in enough position and walk away from them to change our water. If we have to change the water or do something, we're going to need to put that bed back down in low position. We wash from the cleanest areas to the dirtiest areas. And we rinse off all soap, rinse all soap off and dry completely as we're going. Um, so you wash an area. You rinse it, you dry it, and then you move to the next part of the body. You're only uncovering the part of the body you're actually working with. The rest of it should be covered with that bath blanket for that warmth and privacy. If we have someone in a shower or in a tub, we don't leave them alone. We have to be careful about the water temperature. So one of the things that we have found is that when we were talking about safety, one of the potential problems with an elderly person is, is some of their sensory, remember we said that the skin has heat receptors, cold receptors, pain receptors, sometimes those sensation um, starts to decrease as a person gets older and they don't really notice how hot the water is anymore. And in a nursing home, it's a really common cause of burns in a nursing home having that water temperature be too hot. You always want to let the person do as much for themselves as they can. So you can get a washcloth and hand it to them to do their own face. Or if they can do their own arms and chest, let them. If they can get their um, perineal area, let them. Okay, We'll wash whatever they can't do, but we want to try to encourage them to do as much as possible. Now when you're bathing someone, and we'll be teaching you how to do this in the clinical setting, you want to make sure, I mean we have soap and water and we're rubbing them, we rinse off, but we always pat dry. We don't just take a towel and just, you know, really rub the skin really hard because it can um, tear. So again, this is our elderly population and their skin becomes much more fragile. So a complete bed bath is for people who cannot bathe themselves um, and or if they don't want to go to the shower, if it's their shower day and they don't want to go to the shower, they can have a complete bed bath. We wash everything. We wash from the eyes and the face all the way down to the toes front and back. Every part of their body is going to get washed. So remember, we do not overexpose them. We let them do as much for themselves as they possibly can. We wash all the body parts of the body. And if we notice anything, when we're washing the person, when we're giving a bath or a shower, and we notice they have a red area on their bottom, or rashes, or blisters, or tears, we always need to make sure, or bruising, we need to make sure we let the nurse know um, as soon as we're done with our bath. A partial bath, so a complete bath, I'm telling you that you're going to wash the entire body, front and back. Now, that is, does not include a shampoo. Okay, shampoo is actually considered separate. But a partial bath, and it can actually be done at the sink or it can be done in bed. But with a partial bath, we wash the face, so we get the eyes and the face. We wash the underarms, which is the axilla. 
the back, if the back gets sweaty because it's laying against the sheets all the time, and then the perineal area, front and back of the perineum. Um, so it's the, it's the face, the hands, and the underarms. So you'd think the arms would be included, but it's actually just underarms, hands, face, and the perineal, the back and the perineal area. You don't have to do the chest, you don't have to do the legs or the feet. They should have at least a partial bath done every day, and it doesn't have to be done all at once. So say, for instance, you come in in the morning, and let's say your patient just woke up, and let's say they were incontinent. So you're getting them cleaned up and you're doing perineal care. You're getting them cleaned up in the front and the back, and you're cleaning up all their privates, and you're um, putting a new brief on them if they wear that, and you're getting them ready for breakfast. So you've just done perineal care. Okay, now, of course, after perineal care, we would take our gloves off, wash our hands, and so now we're getting them ready for breakfast. And so we're going to let them wash their hands and their face before breakfast. So now they eat, and after breakfast, we can get their back for them, their underarms if they can't reach them, and there you go, you just had, had a partial bath. So it's, you know, I mean, everybody should usually have at least a partial bath every day. If they're overweight, if you have a person who's overweight, you need to make sure in all the folds, anywhere where the skin, like a roll of um, fat hangs over another part of the body, it gets wet and moist in there, and you need to make sure all the folds are washed and dried really well. Tub, bath, and shower, again, cannot stress this enough, be careful of your water temperature. When you're bathing someone or showering someone or giving a tub bath to someone, we ask them to check the water, but you also check the water in case their sensation isn't as good. As falls and burns are always the big concern when we have someone in the shower or in the tub. A person should only be in a shower or a tub for 20 minutes, so we don't leave them in there for hours to soak. Um, when someone's in heat for a long period of time, it dilates the blood vessels of the body. They can, um, blood can just kind of drop down out of the main part of the body to the lower part of the body, and they can get dizzy and lightheaded. So remember privacy and warmth, and again, I realize that's hard to do if they're in a tub or a bath. We want to make sure privacy curtains are pulled, or that we have the sign on the door of the shower room, that there's someone in there so people just don't come and walk in. They also have privacy curtains in the shower rooms and the tub rooms. Um, and any items that they need to get them cleaned up, we want to have them right there. And then, of course, when we're done with our shower or helping the person with the shower or the tub, we all, it is our responsibility to clean it out afterwards when we're done. Now, back massages are a great thing for patients, especially at nighttime. As a matter of fact, a couple places I've worked at, at nighttime, they actually had policies that you would give a back rub in the evening because it helps promote relaxation and circulation. And it's a great way to look at their skin and take a good look at their skin. So usually back massages are done for three to five minutes, but honestly, even if you did it for a minute or two, it's gonna feel wonderful for them. Try to warm the lotion up. I used to always, when I was giving a bath, I would just put the lotion in the bath water to start warming it up, the, the bottle of lotion in the bath water to start warming it up so it would be warm when I took, was ready to put it on. Um, start at the buttocks, because so you start out just right here above the bottom and you just kind of rub up with your hands. Um, you kind of do this rubbing up motion, and then you just kind of do small circles coming back down and coming up. And then you do that for a couple minutes, and then you can do little massages. But just remember that these people are elderly and more frail, so you've got to be careful of how, you know, how hard you're rubbing. Again, we're going to look at the skin for anything, any reddened areas, any skin broken up areas, blisters, anything that doesn't look right. And if you do see a reddened area that's you know, let, let's say the person does have a reddened area, don't massage those areas. You don't ever want to massage over areas that where there's broken skin or red skin or blistered skin because you can actually tear it open and make it worse. Perineal care. So perineal care is cleaning the privates. And so this is the fem what the female perineum looks like. And you can see that the urethral opening, and the urethral opening is Cons the urethra is considered sterile. The urinary system is a sterile system, um, other than the immediate opening right here of the urethra. But otherwise, the urinary system is a sterile system. So we have the urethra, we have the vaginal opening, and then we have the rectal opening. And they're all very close in proximity. So our directionality of how we clean someone is exceptionally important. We always want to clean the cleanest is the urethra, because that's the urinary system we said is a sterile system. So when we're cleaning someone, we start here at the top. So we open up the labia, the folds here 
of the, the opening around the vagina is the labia. So we open up around the labia. We spread it open and we clean from the top to the bottom, okay, with one stroke of our washcloth. Then we come on this side from top to bottom with a different stroke of our washcloth, and our washcloth has soap on it. Then you close the labia, and you're going to go from, sorry, my arrow keeps disappearing, top to bottom again on the outside of the labia, and with another part of the washcloth, and top to bottom with the other. So we're going to use four sides, four different sections of our washcloth to do this. So that one had soap on it. So now I'm going to repeat it again. I'm going to go with a brand new washcloth, and, and so this is one thing when we do perineal, when we, when you're giving a bath to a person, let's say I'm washing the chest, I can soap up my washcloth, wash their chest off, use that same washcloth, rinse off the soap, and go ahead and wash the chest again, or rinse the chest off, the soap off the chest. When you're doing perineal care, every stroke you take is a new part of the washcloth, and that washcloth, once it has touched the person, it never goes back into that water. It is considered contaminated at that point. So I have one washcloth to soap off the, that are the, the perineal area, one to rinse off the perineal area, and I go the same way, top to bottom with one stroke, top to bottom with another part of the washcloth, top to bottom with another part of the washcloth, top to bottom with another part of the washcloth, and then I pat this area dry. Now I'm going to roll them on their side, and I'm going to do the bottom. When I do the bottom, I cleaned to here, so I got this area to here clean, so I'm going to start here because this is clean, and I'm going to come up the bottom, I'm going to go up the bottom that way. So new part of the washcloth, another new part of the washcloth, another new part of the washcloth. Okay, so we clean each section with a new part of the washcloth with each and, each and every stroke. Um, we do peri care daily and as needed. So we do it once a day and if they're incontinent. So if you have a patient that's incontinent, every time they're incontinent, we're going to get them cleaned up. If they're not incontinent, if you help someone to the bathroom, then they can usually just wipe themselves. So, um, now as far as if I was giving a complete bath, and let me just back up here real quick. If I was giving a complete bath, or even that partial bath, because perineal care, peri care, the, the front and the back, of the perineal area, is part of a partial bath and part of a full bath. So if I'm giving a bath, I need to change my water out. I saved the perineal area for last, and I'm going to change my water out when it's time to do the perineal area. Um, so I'm going to get brand new water. And um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that part. So I have brand new water when I'm doing this, um, this pericare here. If you're doing male pericare, start with the tip of the penis, so the urethral opening. Um, the urethra of the urinary system is that tip of the penis. You want to start with the tip of the penis and then work away from the tip of the penis, a new part of the washcloth each time. If they have foreskin, if they have not been circumcised, we want to make sure we retack the foreskin, actually pull the foreskin back. You wash the tip of the penis, you rinse the tip of the penis, you pat it dry, you pull the foreskin back over it, and then you come down and clean the rest of the shaft of the penis and the rest of the peri area for a male. As far as reporting and recording, when you're bathing someone after you've been giving them a bath, if you notice any signs of bleeding, any signs of breakdown, any rashes, any unusual odors, any changes in, the, in your observations from before in their skin, we want to make sure we let the nurse know so that they can come and take care of it. So we're not, um, you know, waiting until the condition gets worse until we end up having a, a really big problem. And we will stop there.